So the next step is, as a lot of people did, he thinks, ah, I'll go to Africa, I'll make my fortune. And uh, perhaps the family would like to be rid of it, perhaps they paid his fare. When I used to be a social worker, we used to joke about some families we'd say, okay, we'll get them a ticket to the next county. But I wonder if with him, <laughs> somebody said, for goodness sake, we've got to get him out of Europe, we've got to get him abroad, send him to Africa, where it's dangerous, he might not even survive the first month. So, off he goes, to Pouch and Jane. Now when he's in Africa, when he dies, one of the obituary says, this colony will never look upon his life again. But you could say it about Hitler, you could say it about Stalin, you could say it about Mother Teresa. I mean, it could be good news or bad news, but certainly, in many respects, it's a long time before Africa saw Tankery's life again. So, here, the, here is the advert in, in, the, in the paper for the ship that they went on, the very voyage they went on, and they've got George Donaldson, commander, who knows all about conditions in the colony, and he's an, an old trader, and he's going to give every information uh, about emigrating to this flourishing, flourishing colony. Well, it wasn't actually flourishing, it was a war zone, effectively, where he was going, and families were being persuaded to go because the British government wanted to have white people to further inland to save the people who came down from being frightened and also to, to have more English-speaking people. They didn't want Afrikaans, Dutch-speaking people, who were the other people there at the time. The Dutch had owned the Cape until just 1806. So the British then fight a battle as they do and took over the Cape. They didn't know then that they would find the inherit all the diamond mines and gold mines further north, once they fought the Boer War, get rid of that part. So off they go, and they embark at Gravesend on Boxing Day. It always seems to travel around Christmas for some reason. And this is an early, early image, obviously, but at that time there weren't jetties where you could moor a boat, and very often the, the boat was in the middle of the river. So they Boarded. We don't know when they exactly sailed because the weather was bad, if there's lots of fog, lots of mist, then you just have to sit and wait. And so off he goes, but he doesn't just go with his wife and their three children. What has he bought to take with him? He, he's got some of Lord Weston's best sheep, who also loaded on the boat, because he's going to be a farmer. Now, he had been a curious and all of that, so you know, he, he had a flock in a sense, the congregation had been his flock. Now he thinks he can be a different sort of flock keeper. He's going to be a farmer. They're going to go to this remote place in which he had no knowledge, no experience, he's never been a farmer. They're going to take all, not anybody's old sheep, but all Western's best sheep. So off they go. And Tancred now is 38. And the eldest child, um, Augustus Frederick, he's, he's, uh, he's eight. And the daughter, Evelina, is seven, and the youngest child, Oswald, is only five. And what does he do? Because he's got eight weeks on this boat before he gets to where he's going, which he's not got a clue where it is. He decides to write a book during the voyage. And then imagine this scene in which Tancred turns to Evelina and says, Now you run a tend to the children, to the sheep and the children, while I compose my thoughts on polite philosophy. Do you mean you're scribbling, my dear? No, no, for of course the book I'm writing, which are my humble guides on ways of setting differences between men. He never mentions women. You were saying, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing. Just admiring the view. The clouds and the birds. Run along then to see the clouds and the birds will take care of themselves. You see, you see, you see so the sheep and your children. I assume he means our children. So, He's a very tiresome man. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is purely fictitious, but he must have been the most difficult man in any circumstance to be married to or to be the children of. He's, he's, he's a 
So off he goes to the dark continent. So he's gone down, they've gone down past the European coast. They have this game, all this, they've survived that. They've gone past the Straits of Gibraltar. They've gone down the west coast of Africa. And this is, um, this is an eight week voyage. It's not nothing on a tiny boat. And it's got two classes of passengers. The uh, adults are listed separately, the children just lumped together. There's no mention of the sheep. If you look at the blue wakey wakey, the blue dot at the back. Go back, go back. The blue dot. The blue dot. I know. We practiced this. That's Lake Victoria. Everybody knew that, I'm sure. Lake the, the thing about Africa compared to where they've come from is it's huge. Lake Victoria, you could fit Ireland into Lake Victoria. Almost all of this island will go into Lake Victoria. It's nothing like what they've known. They've come to what is then in Victorian mythology, the dark continent. For a start, it's full of dark people. It's full of wild animals that will eat you, lions and elephants that will trample you, snakes that will bite you, spiders that will kill you. And the, the, the vegetation is different. In the Victorian imagination, it's a place of jungles and people swinging from trees. And if you don't die of some dreadful disease, you'll probably be put in a cooking pot. And boy, especially if you're a missionary. Those sort of postcards were around not so long ago. There's a kind of joke that Johnny Black people, boiling missionaries and things. It's kind of mythologized. Now, Talking about tanker, we have to remember that this is Victorian England, this is the age of empire, imperialism. They're going out, they're not going out with kind of social consciences or political awareness or political correctness. They're going out to make a fortune. And if it means squashing the indigenous people, grabbing their land, then so be it. So here they go, they've got all these dangerous things ahead of them, but they're going to make a fortune, so it's all going to be all right. So they arrive in Africa in 1842, and... Africa? Okay. <laughs> okay. Ah, here we are. <laughs> so down the bottom is... Cape Town, and that's where they're headed for to start with. And later he says, he's not actually going to land in Cape Town, but he says, being the madman he was, he said, I regret afterwards not calling on the governor. Well, you can imagine the governor waiting in Cape Town to receive this matter. Um, he's just kind of got this delusion of grandeur, really. But where are they going on, having come these 8,000 miles over a Eight weeks. They're going on to the next place along on the right. Oh, yeah, it's working. It's working. <laughs> they're going to Algo Bay, which is now the one Port Elizabeth. And to get there, they're going past the southernmost point of Africa, which is Cape of Gullis and not Cape Town. Cape of Gullis is where the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean divide. So if you swim in the water to the left of that, it's jolly cold. If you swim in the water to the right of that, it's, it's warm weather. And I grew up to the right of it on the Natal Indian Ocean coast, so it's nice and warm for swimming. So they get there, but they still don't have to arrive where they're going. They've now got to go inland, 70 miles, and they head off once they've, they've got there. But this is them arriving. They're sort of slightly later, but these are a series of paintings by Thomas Bain. There's nowhere again to moor the boat. So they've got to get into one of these boats to be ferried ashore with the, with the sheep, remember, don't forget the sheep, animal welfare. And on they go, and this is where they land next. This is an early, almost the same time sketch of Port Elizabeth, which is starting to be a, a town. There's a big house there, and that's, well, the house on the top left is the house of the minister who goes with Parker's party, which we'll come to later from Passage West. So he's, he's this guy, he's, it's a long story, but he, he ends up there in Port Elizabeth. And onward we go. Onward we go. They go on to Grahamstown, which is another 
70 miles. And this is the case of catching the train on the plain or getting the taxi, because this is by horseback, ox wagon. Sometimes the grown-ups grown -ups would have to walk beside the ox wagon. I presume the sheep, Lord Weston's best sheep, remember, would have to march in, in tune to the rhythm of the ox wagon. And this, significantly, is not a modern, bustling metropolis. This is a frontier town. It's founded by a man called Lieutenant Colonel John Graham, hence Graham's town, and it's there as a secure fort, part of the town that's growing up around it, to protect the white people to the south of there from the Corsa people. Now the Corsa are the people who have their land stolen from them, so that, to say the least, not best pleased, but the British Army's got firepower. And when 10,000 causes attack the uh, few hundred British soldiers, guess who wins? The, the British win, and many, many causes are slain. Now, this is a battle that goes on every day. The AMC, the, the, the uh, elections going on in South Africa at the moment, are all about this thing of land grab and the black people wanting their land back, which they claim was stolen from them. You can see if you don't have a purely white perspective, they've got a point. So that's Graham's term. And having arrived there, um, that, that, by the way, as of last year, was, was renamed. That the cause of the leader was a man called Bakana. Last year, June last year, Graham's term was renamed Makanda to recognize the other man who'd been influential at this time. So that's now Makanda. And on would we go. Well, he's written this book on the boat, and now he's going to publish it. So he hops along for local uh, news, newsprint place and says, Would you like to publish my book? I'll pay you 10 bob or whatever. Whatever he took. His book is published. It's given this wonderful title, A Treatise on Polite Philosophy, or An Easy, easy Manner of Settling Differences Among Men. Now this is the man, is he the best person to be writing this book? But not only is he not the best person, but he makes this extraordinary claim that under the patronage of Her Majesty's royal parent, Her Majesty's Victoria, under the patronage of Victoria's, Victoria's parent, I ventured and succeeded. Well he didn't, he flopped, he totally crashed and burnt. And so he goes on, I venture and trust that there shall not be less successful in Africa than in Europe. Well, he wasn't successful. It was a disaster in Europe. And is he the best person to advise? Because on the, when he's struggling for the Board of Governors at the workhouse, what he says about them, his bosses is, he describes them as conceited upstarts who conceive themselves the mighty men of the earth. They're thick-headed, blustering radicals whose principal qualification for office they hold is the talent of gabbling loudly and incessantly. And he writes to the right on Earl Grey, the secretary of the colonies in London. I think Earl Grey and Teeth, the same family. I once respected you, account, you on account of your father, although there was not a feature in your face resembling him. For that deficiency, your mother, I dare say, can satisfactorily account. So is this a good man to be advising people on settling differences? I think not. And of course, he's got an opinion of himself as well. He says about himself, Dr. Tancred, a gentleman well known for his literary talents and for the exemplary manner in which he discharges his duties as minister of the church. And think, well, he hasn't. He's been chucked out. He's made a total disaster of it. And when these letters were received in London, which he always writes to headquarters, he doesn't write to Cape Town, the local man, he writes to the headquarters, he writes to Downing Street. And anyway, this official wrote on these letters, when Tancred's letter was received in London, an official wrote, the enclosed are a continuation of Dr. Tancred's ravings. I think they got it, huh? And we'll discover later, the chances are that he didn't even write this blessed book. He found a book, brought it with him, tore the cover page out, the contents page out, and said, now, you publish that, but put my name in under it. So, did he write the book? 
But he didn't want to go on writing those sort of books. He wanted to go on writing letters. He wanted to be an educationist then. So what does he do? He attempts to form a school. He calls it the Albany College. Albany is the name of the district. And he puts a huge, huge advertisement in the local paper, the Grandstown Journal, uh, in which he says, well, I've got my own children to educate. If there are 10 or 12 other pupils who need to be educated, I intend to unite with three or, three or more men of classical and scientific education. Professors of ability will be sought to fill the different chairs of literature, and there's going to be a lot of moral instruction and conduct will be looked after. This is this tiny frontier town where they're being overrun by the causes, and all they're doing is wanting to, to kind of survive. And what people uh, need, I mean, must be able to be reading, writing, arithmetic, but they need to know about farming, ideally, and perhaps building a house or building a fort or something. They don't need to know of this. Um, and oh, it's not only that, it's a remarkable man. Elocution is going to make sure that elocution is regulated by the principles contained in the public lectures recently delivered by Dr. Tancred and proved by men eminent for learning. And not only that, Dr. Tancred will occasionally deliver lectures to the students, at which the public may attend gratis. <laughs> so this, this must have gone has been hugely exciting for me. And yeah, they, they can be bored, it's but where's he gonna house them? We don't he's gonna house himself, where's he gonna house them? And look at this, they're gonna be dressed as if they were in Oxford. They're in a, in a tropical climate, for goodness sake. <laughs> Um, these, these are the kind of people who are the best able to be farmers and quite simple tasks. But they've got to go around the college dress in Oxford, if that's what it is, or he just made it up. So there they are, this absolutely stifling heat, going around in black cloth cap, silk tassel, with a long camel coat in that village that we saw in the earlier image. And not only this, where can you come to terms with the people? <laughs> 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 this is all listed. This is what they get to have. Oh, this is what's on offer. Almost everything you can think of. Almost everything. History is sacred and profane. What on earth? <laughs> Logic and metaphysics is required. <laughs> and um, so on and so on. But it, that's not all, because if the kids want music, drawing, painting, dancing, fencing, medical attendance, posters or letter, and school books, these will be at an extra charge. <laughs> now, was this a realistic proposition for a frontier town? No. <laughs> so, not surprising, no more is heard of the Albany College, but a lot more is heard of Dr. Tancre. So from now on, he's the frontiers man. He's going back to this business of a farmer, that's what you've gone there for, with Lord Weston's best sheep. And he, he wrote, later about this period. In 1842, I left England with a view to acquire independence in this colony of whose flourishing condition I heard so much. I thought nothing could exist to prevent me immediately commencing sheep farming. Well, one of the things that could have prevented was it is actually ignorance of farming, sheep or anything else. And also, when I went to look at this district and look at his house and everything, they were actually growing pine apples. He wasn't a sh sheep farmer in sight. He wasn't a suitable area for sheep farmer, but there you go. So what we have is that um, Lord, uh, Dr. Tancred has his house, and you can almost imagine from an old MacDonald's farm, Dr. Tancred had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, Lord Western sheep were on the farm, E-I-E-I-O, and the farm he built a house, E-I-E-I-O, and he has his house. Now, this is the boy who's baptized in St. Finbars in 1804, and his father was the shame, I could say sheep, uh, stain maker and such like, breeches maker in Cork, who was bankrupt in 1831. So he's moved on in the world, and this is now his house. And this is a traditional old frontier farmer's house with things added on. The thing at the front and the thing at the back. But otherwise, it's absolutely as it was. And when I went to visit this house, I met this new occupant who didn't speak English. I didn't speak their language, so we didn't get very far. And 
must have thought, who on earth was this strange man who'd come to, uh, come to look at their house? But that was not the fact itself. Meantime, in the background, waiting to attack, of course, are the, what were called at the time the Kaffir Wars. Uh, the, the, one of the famous books of this time is called The Eruption of the Kaffir Hordes. Well, if you're a white farmer, that's what it would seem like. But if you're a black tribesman, you'd think these people are stealing my land. Quite reasonably, I would say. In 1846, he attends a meeting to, about defending the frontier, meeting the common danger. So the danger is there. But he's not worried about the danger because. Um, he writes again to Earl Grey, I am not as yet a knight, capital K, but as the wheel is always going around, that also may come with a baronetcy attached to it, but if the present heir of Boroughbridge should die without issue. Well, he always claimed he related to this posh family in Boroughbridge in Yorkshire. There's no actual evidence of it, but he seemed to have it fixed in his mind that it was true. So even if things go pear-shaped, in Africa, he can always go back and become a baronet. Now, two things wrong with it, at least. The baronetcy of the Tankards of Boroughbridge doesn't come with a knighthood attached. And secondly, the baronet and his son and everybody else had an issue coming out of the loins. There was no shortage of, of, of issue. So maybe word didn't get to him in Africa. He didn't know he wasn't going to become the baronet. Or he, he just made it up, more likely, I think. And it is getting tough for the, for the incomers. Finally, he writes, he has to flee this house when everybody round about had their farms burnt, their cattle stolen and everything. And it's difficult to know at times whose, whose side one, one feels sympathetic towards, because it's pretty grim, whichever side you're on. He flees back into Grahamstown, he writes, finding accommodation uh, at a reasonable price, any price, is very difficult. And then, in the depth of winter, without even a fireplace, amid stench and annoyance of every kind, I was compelled to remain during three months unassisted by anyone and cared for by few, amid the noise, hubbub, and uproar of children. Well, these are actually his children. But no mention of his wife, no mention of what it was like, like for the children. It's all about me. He's never, never, hardly ever mentioned anybody else. Never mentioned the children. Once he mentions the wife, we'll come to that almost immediately because he then writes um, a little bit later, disease brought on by damp, attacked my family during several weeks and whilst attending on the part of, of my existence, existence in a helpless, dangerous and rheumatic state, the next loss I apprehended was of one whom I valued more than all I lost, and which heaven was pleased not to inflict. So Evelina had been ill, but she hadn't died. Well, she didn't hang on for long, because the next thing is Evelina does die. And Kira is now a widow and a single parent. He's 43, the eldest boy is 13, Evelina the daughter is 12, Oswald Penn. We don't know what any of these young people, what it, what it meant to them. He certainly doesn't write about them. That's the only mention of Evelina in the whole story. He never mentioned it. It's all about poor me, poor me, poor me. But meantime, putting Evelina, his wife, who's died, as it were, on the back burner, so to speak. Um, he becomes a civil rights activist. And this is what he's most famous for and most regarded for insofar as he is regarded in the history of the Cape. And this is the case of Smith v. Lindsay. Smith was a young man, 18, centre family. Uh, Lindsay was the colonel of the, of the fort in Fort, fort Petty. Fort Petty, not surprised, is named after Lieutenant Colonel John Petty. And that's all that's left of it, but he would have had cavalry and barracks at the time. And this is really in front of the country, a dangerous place to be. Smith is employed as a wagon driver, a civilian wagon driver. 
and the wagon drivers would go out and fetch wood to bring it into the fort to make firewood, water, heat, water, whatever. And because they'd been attacked a few days earlier by the cause, so they on this occasion refused to go. And there's confused accounts of who said what and who did what, but the point of the story is that Smith is, Lindsay decides that Smith should be flogged. He gets 25 lashes that have been largely bargy about um, who did what, who said what, but no, it goes ahead. And then Tancred comes to be involved in the aftermath of that. So this is actually from an Irish site because the military are going around flogging soldiers but also their enemies. And in this case, United Irishmen, they flog. So this, this pers persisted until 1881. And as you'll see, some of the evidence given in support of Lindsay, they, they thought it was a jolly good thing. But the issue in the law was, have the army got the right to flog civilians? And when it came to court, um, then Ebden, who was the man who was actually prosecuting Lindsay, who to make matters more confused, was normally a defence lawyer, and the man defending Lindsay was a man called Porter. Um, the defence, the prosecuting lawyer said about the Attorney General, his Porter, who's being rushed from Cape Town because in Cape Town the army and the civilian authorities got worried about the rebellious time to streak in the, in the frontier. These people are actually standing up for their own rights. So he says, oh well, the Attorney General has been rushed from Cape Town 500 miles on horseback to near Port Elizabeth to defend Colonel Lindsay. They're really worried, they're, they're quite threatened by this. The local people are kind of in a bit of a quandary. They want the army there to defend them, but they don't want their civilians to be flogged either. So it's a bit of a, bit of a difficult one, that. So, um, Porter, who's from the Cape, he, he's, a, he's an Irishman, I'll say a bit about him in a minute, but he's an Irishman, and one of the things he says in very long speeches he makes is, I'm not an advocate for flogging, but an advocate who has been pretty well flogged in his time. what? <laughs> so you're not sure who's, who's defending what. And we then come to the cross-examination of Smith, which actually tells us much about Tancred. So if I imagine myself as, as the Attorney General Porter, this is the data from the trial. When did you first become acquainted with Tancred? I didn't know him until he sent for me. Where was he then? At Mr. Charles Fuller in Grahamstown. You have been a good deal with him since? Yes, for a fortnight. Carrying a cat of nine tails about the streets. Were you with him when he carried a cat of nine tails? Never. Do you know he's been going through the country to collect subscriptions? I knew he was going through the area. Have you ever got any money from him? No, I never did. Did you ever give him authority to collect money on your account? I don't understand what you mean. Did you ever give your consent for him to collect money to defray the expenses of your trial? Yes, I have no objection. So from this we learn immediately that Tancred has put Smith up to it, and so Tancred is going to be the target of the Attorney General. Tancred has been collecting money, and he's got a fantastic sense of public relations and publicity. He wanders around the cat of nine tails to get people kind of emotionally involved. Smith has agreed to Tancred collecting money, and before long, the Attorney General is accusing Tancred of being the collector of money, the auditor of the money, the, and keeping the accounts of the money, and then kind of the hint is, you know, how much of that money goes into his own pocket. And then the sum of the money involved was a thousand pounds, which is a huge sum at that time. And these aren't just hit country lawyers, these are the top notch, and the these people all go on to become very important lawyers in South Africa. So the question really is, was this something to do with what happened in Nottingham? When Tancred goes to court, when the schoolmaster Keynes a boy, also called Smith, but not related, and also charges the chap in charge of the workhouse with 
abusing some of the adult residents, women, not men. So why is this issue, corporal punishment, so central, it seems, to tank? Was there something happening in his school days? Why is he so incensed at Nottingham? Why is he so incensed when he could keep his nose clean at the Cape? Kid on his farm, his, very, his wife died. The, it's a long, long story in itself, but the witnesses are quite interesting. When the army people are called, they all think, you know, Johnny Good, Johnny Good Chap is Lindsay. Jennings, the adjutant, said, for it's not severe for corporal punishment. Had away the surgeons in 20 years, it was the slightest punishment he had ever seen. He'd never seen less than 50 lashes. The greatest he had seen was 500 lashes. Well, despite the fact that in 1812, the Duke of York had, had it cut to 300 lashes. Uh, and even when, he's, uh, even when this guy had seen 500 lashes, he'd never seen a man suffering bodily health. And he was also against flogging the argument, saying, so which side was he on? The staff surgeon thought it was a slight punishment, evidently a humane man. But later in his closing speech to the jury, Porter, speaks for two and a half hours. And a lot of it is rubbishing Tancred, who they see as the villain of the piece. So he goes on about the well-drilled witnesses that Tancred has got up to, it, the famous misrepresentations of John Crawford Smith and Augustus Joseph Tancred. Tancred. And Tancred is a man who writes DD after his name. He's been collecting subscriptions. He's a collected treasury auditor. And a man who commenced his career in this colony by fraudulently putting his name to the literary work of another man. That was the book he wrote when he landed in 1842. So, somehow or other, the Attorney General knows something, but he's not able to give it an evidence. Anyway, the judge summed up and he told the jury that nothing, no problem, all the relevant points of law pointed to the fact that there was no case to answer. So the jury go out, and he had this advice from the judge. What do they do? They come back about 10 minutes later, find Lindsay guilty. <laughs> and then Lindsay's find the token of mouth. And ah, the surprising fact is, or not surprising, of the nine jury men, <laughs> of the nine jury men, five out of the nine had subscribed to the, 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 the subscription that the bank collected to, 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 to prosecute Lindsay. Five of the jury had done that. So let's take a look, brief look at Porter because he's an Irishman, an extraordinary man. He became known as the father of Cape liberalism. He believed in all sorts of admirable things, self-government for the Cape. He's opposed to capital punishment. He is in favor of a common voters' role regardless of race. Man. And he believes in higher education for women, he hates oppression, and he favor of religious freedom. You couldn't fault him. How did he come down to be like this? Well, he's born in the Mavadi, the north of this island, this island we're on now. And his father was the Presbyterian minister there. And they're quite a liberal lot. And they sent old William Porter to um, try and get him. Um, effectively working for a, lot, a, a family friend, a business in Dublin, where there's a man with the name of O'Connell wandering around preaching for, arguing for Catholic emancipation. And Porter is, uh, a, in a sense, a colonial figure because he's there in the kind of the plantation territory of the north of this island, and their incomes as a family, not so long before. And uh, he's uh, it's quite extraordinary. He trains as a lawyer, uh, goes to London, comes back. There's oversupply of barristers in Dublin. So he goes back to London. Fine, fine, as a young man, he goes out to the Cape as Attorney General with his lifelong friend, a man called Hugh Lynar. And they live together forever. They travel together on the boat. They live together in Cape Town. They go everywhere together. And when Lynar dies, Porter comes back to Ireland and lives with his brother in Belfast till he dies in 1880. He is a hugely important figure, unlike Tancred, who's at the best a kind of a joke thief. 
Whatever we say about poetry of Smithy Lindsay, he is the most important thing. The issue then has been the threat to the, the authorities in Cape Town and the army being there to protect the civilian population. And if we think of it in current terms, if we have a Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in March this year, who said that the army on a date in 1972 in Belfast, the army acted in a dignified and appropriate way while fulfilling their duties, bloody Sunday. Isn't it the case that there's always a danger that people will say, okay, let the army had to do a difficult job, they were under risk. Exactly the same argument here is going on in Smith v. Lindsay. Exactly the same argument. They've got this awful job, they've got these thousands of causes, they've got too few men, they're protecting the civilian population. Anyway, after this latest day of article, Tancred sells up, sells up, and so his farm comes up for sale and he leaves the colony to attend the management of certain matters matters devolving on me since the death of Mrs. Tancred, but we don't know what that matters these are. But there's something going on in Europe. Has she got some money, some estate? Has he got to provide for the children? And, but before going, he sells his farm, sells everything, and decides he's going to provide a hospital for Brownstown with the money he receives. What else? But this is only going to be for the respectable indigent population. And it's not for people who want to be what, what mixed up with people of colour and indiscriminate cases. In other words, the old deserving versus undeserving for. So you can't have any coloured people, you can't have indiscriminate cases, but there must be no religious distinctions. And when he gets back to England, what's he going to do? He's going to bring Smith feelings in before the British public, and he's going to use whatever humble, humble influence I possess with some members of the House of Commons. Well, of course, he had no influence whatsoever with members of the House of Commons. But anyway, he goes off to Europe, taking the children with him. Whether he takes them to family or not, I don't know, but he, he, um, he goes back and there's one reference to the, the eldest son being educated in France, which makes me think that they were all educated in France. I don't know what, what where he left them or why. Um, now, after all of this happened, there's a new story, part of the story that kind of emerges from the shadows. Some point he's claimed to take the body back to Devon, that's Evelina's body. And in his one of his obituaries, um, it says he left for Europe with her remains and they were interred in Devonshire, from which county she came. Well, she came from Tullamore. So it didn't come from Devon. Um, and how, six months later, did you take a body back to Devon? Um, and even later, in 1918, the story was still growing, and new newspaper article, Dr. Tancred has, it took her remains to be buried in her native county. Well, she was born in Tullamore. So what happened to Evelina? Well, let's look at the mail register, St. Patrick's Catholic Church, Grahamstown, and there she is. Now whether, and what's interesting is nothing is said about her, which is unusual in the columns on the right, but whether he then had it dug up and took a bit of it back, we just never know. But it's a strange, strange story. This is a man who's full of strange stories, but you just don't know what to make of it. And I walked all over this hillside with the cemetery in Grahamstown. But of course, if there was a cross, it would have been wooden and decayed. If there wouldn't have been a stone tablet or anything. And I found absolutely nothing. So it's another of those mysteries. This burial register is quite fascinating when you look at it at greater length because uh, they're, they're the comments, Irish <laughs> comment, drink. And of course, a lot of them are, are soldiers. But what does Tankley do next? He's got to do something. What's he do? Where, where does he do? Well, there he goes. Ah, where have we seen that place before? This is an earlier lithograph of Cape Town. He's going back to Cape Town. 
But he's now a wonderful wife. He's got, got rid of the children. And as Jane Austen famously said, one of the most famous bits of English literature. <laughs> It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Well, he lost his wife. He got rid of the children, effectively. Um, he's not got a fortune. He got no income. He um, he's actually wanting a wife with some some money. He wants a wife with some brass, ideally, um, and possibly the future. Of possibly future children who used to know. So here he goes, and the next bit of the story takes us to Clan William, which is in the um, northern Cape, north of Cape Town, and it's about as far from Cape Town as Cork is from Dublin, about the same sort of distance. But the poor roads, you go by horse again, or wagon, and how on earth did he get to be in Clan William? We just don't know. Clan William is where he finds his first um, target, his matrimony, matrimony intentions, and she has the unlikely name, perhaps, of Maria Martha Magdalena Glendina Skenkong. So she's Dutch. And he pays a marriage license fee of 15 pounds in Cape Town to get permission to marry her. But in September the same year, this was January applied for the, for the license, in September the same year, he applies to the governor for the revocation of the marriage license and the return of his 15 pounds. Basically, his trade descriptions act has found that the goods not as described. And he, he describes to the, in the letter to the memorial to the governor, I proceeded to the abode of the lady's parents where I found her laboring under serious illness. Many other difficulties were raised, which had the effect of altogether breaking off the engagement. I closed the license, as you may see, it had never been made use of, or even the envelope had closed it ever opened. So if he opened it, he had it over the catalogue and could seal it up again. So he said, no, don't no, no, no want it, you're not, you're not, not right for me. But how did he come to be in Clan William? Now, Clan William, Clan William is um, interesting for that reason, but there's a, re there's a, there's a primary. Clan, Clan William is named, was named when it was sort of more or less founded in about early 1800s. It was called the young Dussel's play, a Dutch name. But of course, just like Kimberley, the colonial authorities did want a thing called Poor Exit or New Russia in Victoria's Empire. So they called it Kimberley, which just happened to be Secretary of State at the time. Here the governor decides on his father-in-law's name. His father-in-law is the Earl of Clan William, which is a peerage of the Irish peerage. So that's how this becomes Clan William. How long it will stay Clan William, one knows not, because it's mostly, mostly not white, white people who live there. Um, it's also famous for the, the 1820 settlers from Passage West. And we had the great, great River is a great new museum yesterday where this park is set forth from. And led by a man called Parker, who was a bit of a, well, depending on your point of view, a different, different man. Um, and they go off to the Cape, and Parker wants to settle near Cape Town, which is where sort of civilization is, the good land is. But the governor decides that he wants the Albany district where Hanker did start off to be English speaking, very English people, English people, no Dutch people, no, no difficult people. If, they, if he allows the Irish to go to the Albany district, God knows what difficulty they may cause. So they get sent to Clan William, which is totally unsuitable for farming. And have we got the map back? Can I get the map back? Yeah, they've got to go up there. They're, they're not at all happy. I hope it's for the sort of farming and sort of skills they have. And very quickly, they've left that area. They've either made their way to Cape Town or over to the Albany district where Tankley began near Brownstown. 
And there are only about four families left after a very short time they come from Cork. And of course there were four separate parties. Park at the, the self passage where Park was just one of them. Now he still hasn't got his wife he was after. Um, but he somehow meets one Jesse Bonzel, who's the daughter of a wealthy farmer in the area. Now, aha, at last, it hit it, it clicked. He's now got a prospect of a wife and money. And, oh, lucky boy. So he actually marries a young woman called Jesse Bonzel. She is the daughter of a wealthy farmer. Her father gives permission. permission and the uh, only thing is, Tancred is now 49, Jesse is 14. And then the marriage eventually produces um, two children, a daughter and a son. So, if you want to make your way in the world, you need a bit of brass behind you. A wealthy farmer, want to be an MP? That's what you're good for. Our uh, hero is now, that's the second marriage, quite difficult to read, but it's um, interesting. There's a signature down at the bottom of Augustus J. Tancred. Still beside himself, D.D., Dr. Divinity, or they've got their right claim. He just goes on to the end. Okay. But he decides to become a parliamentarian. Well, no time at all, he's a member of parliament for Clan William. Surprise, surprise. And his member of parliament for Clan William, this is the first opening of the Cape Parliament. He's a member of the first Cape Parliament, and he's there in spells of time, and then missing links in between the years when he isn't. He goes off and does something else. And that's the actual building, which was the Masonic Lodge, which was the home of the first Cape Parliament, from the Cape of the Archives in Cape Town. Well, as a member of Parliament, you, you'd be surprised, perhaps, to learn if he wasn't a total success. Um, he did support good causes like self-government at the Cape. Um, he supported Dutch becoming an official language. He could be generous to colleagues. He would just suddenly, on a whim, vote that somebody should give a ton of money. And one might describe being astonished at Dr. Tankard. Um, but then he would uh, do extraordinary things. On one occasion, he had to be escorted from the house by the sergeant at arms. Who, uh, and, but as he's doing this, he's singing, Rich and rare with the gem she wore. This wonderful song about this poor, vulnerable young lady in Ireland who's got all these wonderful gems. And it's her virtue, he'd say, never mind her jewelry. She goes wandering through the forest. Um, and for some reason, he sings that when it comes up. Um, he tries to auction, he tries to sell the Parliament building. He announces an auction for the Parliament building. Um, and you'll have a go at the. He, he's, he's going pretty dotty by now. This is one. This is one. This just captures the man, I think. Perfectly. Uh, this is a newspaper article, yeah. isn't it? Dr. Tancred, in a new character, has made his appearance in the public streets of Cape Town in quite a new character. On St. John's Day at Kelly's Hotel, where he is residing, a white banner with a red cross on it was hung out, and soon after breakfast, the doctor made his appearance in Hessian boots, white breeches and vest, black coat, and a helmet, with a large plume of ostrich feathers hanging from it gracefully over his back. After parading the stoop for some time, he engaged a black boy who paraded with the banner through the streets, followed by the doctor in full costume. Of course, this was great fun for the boys who collected in a troop and accompanied the doctor in his peregrinations through the town. The doctor declared himself to be one of the Knights Templars and donned his costume in honor of St. John's Day. His claim to belong to the Masonic Order is repudiated by the Masons. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't make him up. At about this time, he writes to his bank manager, Yes, sir, for the following reasons, I regret being unable to reduce my overdraft. I have been held up, sandbagged, walked up, sat upon, flattened out, and squeezed by our taxes. 
and by every society and organization the inventive brain of man can devise to extract what I may or may not have in my possession. I am drained by the Red Cross, the Black Cross, the Double Cross, and every hospital in the town and country. The government has governed my business so that I do not know who owns it. I am inspected, suspected, examined, re-examined, informed, required and commanded so that I do not know who I am, where I am, or why I am at all. All I know is that I am supposed to have an inexhaustible supply of money for every known need, desire, or hope of the human race. Because I do not sell, or beg, borrow, or steal money to give away, I am cussed, discussed, boycotted, talked to, talked about, lied to, lied about, held up, hung up, robbed, and down near ruined. My only reason why I'm carrying on life now is to see what the hell will happen next. We enter the area of his decline and fall. He's doing crazy things, like he believes we're going to be the next Prime Minister of the case. He tells people I'm going to be Prime Minister. He changes the executive to his will, who is the Bishop of Bishop Grimley of Cape Town. He's suspicious, he's paranoid. His landlady, Mrs. Fock, F O C K, he takes her to court because he says she's been going into his papers, looking at his thing, and she's been following him around. He's going visibly kind of gossy. And in no time at all, he dies in January 1867. Attended by Bishop Gridley, and the newspaper says that his body will be interred the following day, Saturday the 5th, and the notion the paper invites friends to attend in the cortege will lead from his lodging. Well, what's strange here is that normally when somebody who's a member of parliament dies, they have a minute of silence or they say what a great chap he was. There's not a word said in the Parliament. Nor is there any, and I've trudged around with the old cemeteries in Cape Town trying to find out where he might be buried. There's no, no evidence of where he was buried. And there's no report in the paper saying Dr. Tankard's funeral took place on and it was attended by, and then a list of mourners. It goes completely silent. And then we have this letter which probably sums it up from a man called Hall, so he must have been right. We've come to the end of the existence. He's got every simplest dissipation. He make a fool of himself in the house drunk, making a house etc. The obituaries, um, because he's lived in different places, they, they've got different takes on him. And so they say these things, which are quite interesting when you think of all that's at random. He's popular um, for some, he's patriotic. He's, Sympathy for the oppressed. He's uncompromising. He's unselfish, perhaps. Talented. Well, this is significant worse than men with more discretion. I'll tell you, I've made one no discretion. And what do I mean? Oh, we can hear. We certainly got that. I haven't got that. So forgiving. Um, Almost a surgery. This is the, the thing that people think about him when they do think about him positively. Similar reason. Pierre is certainly that. He's going to be Pierre. And uh, an outspoken, certainly outspoken. Um, where are we now? Where are we now? Oh, generosity, good thing. So he's plucky. So he's a pretty mixed bag, and people have to take a different view of him. But, a final kind of comment, perhaps, is this, that, uh, oh yes, well, that, he said, and with a more balanced mind than they met. So, this makes me think that this probably was the, the key to the man. He didn't have a balanced mind, he did bring too much, he was well educated, he was very brilliant. And, uh, well, some people took a, a positive view, but, but essentially this colony will never look at his life again. Too true. Of the descendants, this is the daughter, this is not the daughter, this is a kind of depiction of the daughter Evelina, who took the veil of Bodoy. So this has my belief that he may have dropped them all in France. We've walked around trees, and I've walked around Bodoy looking for convents she might have attended. We've tried to find a grave for her in Bodoy and totally failed. We absolutely failed, but Sadly, we don't know what happened to Evelina. 
young girl who's hardly left child, well, had reached 13 years when her mother died, when she left her married. The youngest son of Oswald Finbar Nagel. Now, when Tancred registered this birth, when he was a, uh, a vicar in Nottingham, he changed the name after several months from Albert Tancred to Oswald Finbar Nagel Tancred. Now, it's only when I saw his death notice that I realized this was his name, Nagel, it wasn't Kyle. And this made me think that perhaps this has something also to do with because of the kind of naval tradition of education. Had this been where he kind of got his, through which he got his school education, perhaps something to do with that, or that he's had some reason to remember that name. Uh, Oswald Finbar said he worked for the Suez Canal Company, but depending who you talk to in the family, he was either second in, second below the lesser, so he was kind of third in the T's. I think it's, we just don't know. But we went to that's the house where he actually died, and so that was quite nice to know what happened to him. And that is the eldest son, Augustus Frederick, who's the one who died for the Diamond Rush days. days. And um, he's the one who's successful, except that he dies young. Um, he's sitting there. You got him? Yeah. Oh, second from the right on the row from the one from the back. Left, 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 left. And next to him is one Charles Donnell Rudd. And before that, Charles Donnell Rudd was. The, th the two were known Rudd and Rhodes. Uh, before too long, Rhodes became much the more powerful man. And although Rudd became very, very wealthy, um, it was Rhodes who everybody remembered of the Diamond Rush days and the gold mines. Uh, Augustus Frederick was the father of this, the cricketing brothers Tancred. They know that three, three men, three sons played cricket for South Africa, which is quite unusual. So they get all the books and people bring out books on family, families who play cricket or rugby or soccer or hurley or whatever uh, for their country. So three of them did. One of them shot himself three times in the head, which carried on the angry tradition. Um, but the youngest was Louis Joseph, who toured with the South African team more than once. And lo and behold, look at him there. The South Africans played the gentlemen of Ireland. I guess you recognize the ground. Mardike. And the pavilion is just is still there, but it's just been just been built at that time. And he would have walked out from that pavilion. Uh, the gentlemen of Ireland won, but of course they were gentlemen, not these wild colonial types. And um, well left for one story, one 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 last turn of the screw in this. This is the question where did it all go wrong? And I think since last time I was here. Um, we're indebted to Anne Marie for actually unwrangling this bit of the story. And it's an extraordinary story. In far too much to go into tonight. But next bit. It turns out that Tancred had, had been a Roman Catholic priest in Cork who flirted with Unitarianism. And this is Mrs. Kirkpatrick who's writing about Augustus Tancred to the Unitarians and say, a Roman Catholic priest turning Unitarian will be valuable to a high degree. Now typically Tancred tells her his story and I think that's what she repeats. So um, what she believes is that um, a Jesuit priest impeached him to his bishop for immorality and incontinence. No, I think that was a certain kind of juices which was seeping from his body. And was this to do with the story that he eloped with a nun? This was the story that came down to the family. He eloped with a nun. This is why he was excommunicated. And all of us in this family were doomed forever. Doomed, doomed, doomed. No hope for us. Because this awful great great grandfather that in my generation we had. So, uh, you have to wonder, was it nothing to do with his, his lying about his qualification, being a doctor? Um, 
what is it just to do with this start in life? Um, we know from this later on in this letter that his mother had been on her knees to him to get him to be a good boy. His family had stopped his private income and at the, in the same year his father goes bankrupt. What's in it for the Unitarians? Well, they believe, as I said, a Roman Catholic priest turned Unitarian would be invaluable to a high degree. And they even believe, it seems, that Ireland, if not the whole British dominions, would be made to ring with the news of a Roman Catholic priest being converted to Unitarianism. Something which strikes the blow against the Roman Catholic Church. And that papers and journals would give currency to the matter. Well, what happened next? Mrs. Kirkpatrick obviously felt very sorry for him. He told her this sorry story, which included a bit about his education, which may or may not be true. Uh, but she offered him five pounds because she thought, poor chap, is short of a book. He turned it down. Quite soon after, he accepted ten pounds and disappeared. He disappeared to England, and we soon know that he's part of the Church of England. Uh, she says he's the bishop the dice is the Bishop of Win Winchelsea, but there isn't, there wasn't the Bishop of Winchelsea, but it's Winchester he goes to the Bishop of Winchelsea, this way he goes to Christ Church. So, um, what, what's this what it's all about? He went from very early in his life. That's what I think it is, and thanks to Anne Marie, because otherwise we wouldn't have known. <laughs> and, um, that's the end of the story, really. Thank you very much for turning out, and thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll leave to know there isn't a part three.